Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. And this one, a lot of news, like the Intel i9-10850K. Intel really trying to get all the use that they can out of those numbers and letters and those long SKU names. Also in the news, 12-pin connectors for NVIDIA Ampere cards, but we have some additional information we've privately confirmed with several manufacturers at this point over the last month now on that story. Linus Torvalds upset, this time at AVX 512, calling it a power virus. We'll also be talking about JEDEC finalizing the DDR5 spec and a couple of other news items for the week. Before that, this video is brought to you by Team Group's T-Force Extreme ARGB memory, which uses a frosted finish on its heatsink to diffuse the lighting across the surface. The Extreme ARGB kits are available in various XMP configurations, including 3200, 16, 18, 18, and 4000, 18, 22, 22. If you're looking for an ARGB memory kit for your next build, check out the link in the description below for the T-Force Extreme memory. A super quick thing on a charity auction before we get into the news for the week. So this is a computer that we reviewed for the NZXT BLD Undercover Review Series, and we don't want it, but we also didn't really want to buy it, review, and then return it. We're trying to move away from that as we're able to financially support it more uh, going forward. So since we don't want the system, we listed it for a charity auction on eBay. We've linked it in the description below. If you put a bid on this thing, Please only do so if you're actually going to buy it. Don't just try and drive the price up because what happens is if someone wins it and they can't pay, then the whole thing has to be done over and is a loss for everybody. So uh, we've been pretty successful with the charity auction so far. This one is benefiting Cat Angels, which we have actually visited. We built a computer for them. They're local. And we have plenty of B-roll of their facility featuring cats that we can show while we're talking about this. But they're a, a no-kill shelter. It rescues cats and then tries to find people to adopt them. We think they do great work. We've uh, looked into them pretty heavily, talked to them in person and all that stuff, and we like what they do. So the system's up. It has a technical retail value of $1,500. So that's the sum of the, the cost of the parts. The team is going to be autographing this side panel. So far, only Patrick and I have signed it, but we'll get everyone else on site to sign it as well. And uh, in the very least, if you don't want the system, maybe you can put the fully signed panel on the wall once we've got everyone's signature on it. So that's up 100% of the uh, auction value is going towards Cat Angels for this one. And whoever wins, we'll, we'll send you a message and ask if you'd like any GN merch as well, like a, a mouse mat or a mod mat or something like that. So I wanted to point that out first. Thank you for checking out the review of the NZXT BLD system, but we don't want it anymore. So feel free to contribute to the charity cause that we've linked below. A quick live stream recap. We normally do standalone videos for these, but decided to just do this in the news video. We did a 3900XT extreme overclocking live stream where we took a 3900XT Tea, we put under liquid nitrogen and then just did a few types of tests. One of them was what's the highest frequency we could achieve and we ran into some points where we want to talk with some other overclockers and try and learn more about how can we bring the temperature down lower because we're getting stuck at about minus 121 degrees Celsius. We couldn't bring it lower without uh, a crash or a cold bug. And so once we have an extra 70 degrees or so of headroom to bring the temperature down, we should be able to increase the clocks even further. But for now, we got stuck at about 5.1 gigahertz all core for the 3900XE. It's definitely possible to do more. That's a point of learning for us to try and push it even further. But 5.1 was interesting because the voltages that we were able to run for those higher frequencies were significantly better than we've seen on some of the other Ryzen chips. So maybe there's something to this XT series being better binned. But like we said in the reviews, they're really mostly worth it for enthusiast class type of overclocking and not really worth it out of the box for standard use or even just lightweight overclocking. So one of the things we saw was about 1.437 volts at 5 gigahertz, which is crazy good. We were running something like 1.35 get for uh, clocks in the 4.8, 4.9 gigahertz range, which is also crazy good for all core. Now keep in mind that's at cold temperatures, but even at only minus 60 or so, we're still holding something like 1.35 volts get for those high frequencies. So that's the quick recap. We do have the stream archive on the channel if you want to catch it. And then again, a huge thanks to everyone from that stream who picked up our PC component shirt, the mod mats, the mouse mats. Uh, those latter two items are coming back into stock in August. We just got these shipments uh, arranged recently. So if you want to support us doing more streams or buying more testing equipment like we've just done recently, we'll be unveiling that new test equipment soon. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to buy things like the PC component shirt that's brand new and has been selling fast, the X570 chipset Metro poster, the GN mod mat for PC building services, or the mouse mats. Let's move on to the next news item. For this one, there's been a rumor making the rounds lately about a 12-pin connector for the upcoming NVIDIA Ampere cards. And 
this is something, first of all, we can confirm that this thing exists. It's not a rumor, it's reality. We've known about this 12-pin connector for about a month now, and uh, it's just, it wasn't really something we thought was super newsworthy because it's a, a cable, but apparently it is. So we'll talk about it here with the information we've collected. We uh, collect a lot of this information from parties who are making products around this, and we've spoken with some of the cable factories related to cable uh, manufacturing to get more information. But this week, the rumor was about the 12-pin connectors from the power supply. And something that we saw super blown out of proportion was some of the, the maybe less technical sites covering this matter were basically saying that you're going to have to rip out half of your computer just to get the 12 pin supported. And that's not really how it works, because even if you look at the patent documents, it's as simple as 12 volt cables and ground cables. It's not like it's not like they're special for a 12 pin connector. It's just that they're in different places, maybe. Or more realistically, uh, it looks different and is shaped differently and has a different key. But it's still 12 volts and ground. So not that hard to adapt. It's not like you have to replace your power supply. So anyway, kind of irres irresponsible reporting when we saw some of those stories. But the 12-pin connections for Ampere are legitimate. Uh, as we currently understand it, it isn't likely to have an effect on the current DIY or enthusiast space. This is more of a product that's targeted towards the OEMs, the SIs, and probably the reference cards. But when in speaking with several of the custom card manufacturers, even when they work with the initial reference boards, which is a design that comes from NVIDIA, they can still swap out the connectors uh, pretty easily without having to do a whole bunch of custom designing. So it sounds like the current plan is that this is mostly going to be an OEM focus, an SI thing, and there may be uh, some cards that run with it, but for the most part, you can expect your standard cards from manufacturers we can't explicitly name, but basically all the big manufacturers of NVIDIA video cards to come with uh, a, a 2x8 pin connector. You'll see some of them with setups that are maybe 3x8 for the sort of higher overclocking configurations, but they're not going with 12-pin for the most part. We also know that this 12-pin connection has been in discussion at NVIDIA for a few years now. So this isn't a new thing for Ampere, it's just that they happen to get around to it now. Uh, so the 12-pin connection's been in discussion for a while. Our understanding is that the 12-pin can deliver something like 600 watts. We need to look into if that number is including the, the 75 watts on the PCIe slot, but it's, uh, from what we understand, it's supposed to be a 600 watt maximum possible connection under spec. Keep in mind that the spec for connectors, like 6-pin and 8-pin connectors, is often under what the cables are actually capable of delivering, so it's on the conservatively low side. So the numbers you see are, are normally underestimated. For example, two 8 pins would do 375 watts or uh, 300 watts plus the 75 from the PCIe slot as an example. 225 for two 6 pins, and that also is uh, counting the PCIe X16 slot. So the 12 pin thing is real. Our understanding is that some of the cable manufacturers are currently scrambling to get everything in place for it. And one thing that we're not sure about, but we're speculating as a possibility, is that NVIDIA may supply uh, some kind of special adapter just to look special with its cards. The only reason we're really saying that is because NVIDIA is kind of going that Apple direction where they're trying to just tack stuff on now to to be different when it doesn't, it's literally Apple's logo or slogan, isn't it? Think different. To try and be different when they don't really have to be, when everything else has worked mostly fine up until now. So they may do some kind of adapter or whatever, but either way, this is not something you need to worry about. It's not going to massively change the way PC building works. You're not going to have to buy new power supplies. It's just 12 volts and ground in a different configuration. Uh, so let's move on. Linus Torvald calling AVX512, quote, a power virus. Linus Torvald is one of the top two Linuses in this industry. Uh, we're not, again, not sure which one comes up first if you just type Linus into Google, but assuredly it's at least one of them. And uh, the resident curmudgeon in the tech community is Linus Torvald. So he's back with another hot take. This time it has to do with Alder Lake uh, possibly not supporting the IVX512 instruction set, and more on that in a moment. Linus Torvalds, if you're not familiar with the name, is the creator and uh, active kernel developer, principal kernel developer for Linux. And his hot take here this time, as is usually the case, uh, does not involve any mincing of words 
about his loathing for AVX 512. Quote, I hope AVX 512 dies a painful death and that Intel starts fixing real problems instead of trying to create magic instructions to then create benchmarks that they can look good on. I hope Intel gets back to basics, gets their process working again, and concentrates more on regular code that isn't HPC or some other pointless special case, Torvalds said via a mailing list uh, via Pharonix. Torvalds didn't stop there, going on to say that, quote, AVX 512 has real downsides. I'd much rather see that transistor budget used on other things that are much more relevant, even if it's still floating point math in the GPU, rather than AVX 512. Or just give me more cores with good single thread performance, but without the garbage like AVX 512, like AMD did. And the rant continued, with Torvalds going as far to say, I want my power limits to be reached with regular integer code, not with some AVX 512 power virus that takes away top frequency because people ended up using it for mem copy and takes away cores because those useless garbage units take up space. Scathing words then from Linus Torvalds, but also not one who is a stranger to such words. We can once again cue the NVIDIA clip with Linus in it. And NVIDIA has been the single worst company we've ever dealt with. So NVIDIA, fuck you. <laughs> As for what AVX 512 is, AVX 512 is a wider vector-based instruction set that Intel has had in deployment now since at least 2013. And despite Torvald's self-admittedly, uh, quote, biased and grumpy rant, it likely isn't going anywhere, at least in the immediate future. Next one, JEDEC, finalizing the DDR5 spec. Over the last few months, we've mentioned DDR5 looming on the horizon, and now the JEDEC organization has finalized the specification, publishing it as the JESD79-5 DDR5 SDRAM standard, which you can read online, or at least part of it. Frankly, there's a lot to go through, and it won't be entirely within the scope of just this news roundup. So we'll recap it quickly. One of the biggest changes for DDR5 is the doubled burst length to BL16 and doubling the bank count to 32. These are both numbers we've mentioned before when SK Hynix detailed some of its early DDR5 specs previously. The idea here is to increase memory access availability and allow for better memory scaling at higher frequencies without compromising channel efficiency. As with previous DDR evolutions, DDR5 will double data rates and offer a significant uplift in density. Some key points of note and takeaways. DDR5 will support double bandwidth of DDR4 starting at 4.8 gigabits per second, which is roughly a 50% increase over the end of life speed of 3.2 gigabits per second for DDR4. Remember that the new iterations of DDR are always going to start at the low end, so there are a few years of advancement for D4 there. DDR5 will support a max data rate of 6.4 gigabits per second. However, as with current DDR4, that's likely to be exceeded. SK Hynix has plans for DDR5 8400. DDR5 will offer single memory chips up to 64 gigabits in density, well beyond DDR4's 16 gigabit maximum. DDR5 also supports die stacking, allowing dies to be eight dies to be stacked as a single chip. And although this shouldn't need to be said, it often does. Uh, there are eight bits in a byte, asterisk most of the time. So when you hear gigabits, or there's a lowercase b, it is not the same as bytes with a capital B. Uh, this is something that you'd be surprised how many people mess this up. So keep that in mind. Uh, other news, UDIMS will support up to 128 gigabytes. DDR5 will now offer two 40-bit fully independent channels on the DIMM, and burst length per channel is going from BL8 to BL16. DDR5 will also reportedly introduce a, quote, fine grain refresh feature. We touched on this previously when SK Hynix discussed its same bank refresh, which allows the CPU to access certain memory banks while others are in operation or refreshing. Same idea here, with the end goal being improving latency and memory bank access. DDR5 is supposed to operate at 1.1 volts, down from 1.2 on DDR4. You likely have seen 1.35 for most of your DDR4. XMP is technically not uh, the spec for the memory, even though the manufacturer might call it as such. JEDEC is what we're talking about here. DDR5 will also employ an on-dim voltage regulator, and this likely has implications for the cost and the complexity of DIMMs going forward as well. DDR5 is supposed to have an on-die ECC, and DDR5 also maintains the same 288 pin count as DDR4, but the pinout has changed. 
So industry adoption is set to begin in 2021. As usual with new standards, the server and enterprise markets will probably see first commercial adoption and client and consumer products will follow that later. The initial versions of DDR5 may end up worse than the high-end versions of DDR4, but this is standard for the switchover, and you typically see a latency of a couple of years for full mass adoption on the market for a new memory standard, even if the rollout is sooner than that. We'll note as well, if you want to read more details on DDR5 as it's known so far, Anantech has a pretty detailed write-up, and they've gone into more discussion with it as well, so you can check out uh, their write-up on the DDR5 specification. Next up, rumors about Alder Lake and the Alder Lake hybrid computing uh, construction not being able to use AVX 512 or FP16. More and more, it seems that the theory we've previously mentioned, the one where Alder Lake will see Intel mix both big and little cores, could become a reality. In a new leak by Twitter user at 9950Pro, a technical document from Intel purportedly shows no fewer than three ADL SKUs with different configurations. The products mentioned, with no official SKUs attached to them, appear to show different big and little core arrangements and TDPs. Of the CPUs listed, all are designated as Alder Lake S, and two of them show an 8 plus 8 plus 1 listing. The other CPU shows a 6 plus 0 plus 1 listing. According to the document, these numbers illustrate 8 big cores, 8 small cores, and GT1. In the case of 6 plus 0 plus 1, that'd be 6 big cores, 0 small, and then GT1, or often graphics. The document states that the big and small cores share the same instruction set and model specific registers, and that when hybrid computing is enabled, the available instruction sets are limited. This appears to hint at the possibility that when using uh, the mixture of big and small cores, AVX 512 and FP16 might actually not be enabled. So those two instruction sets only seem to be available when strictly using just the big cores. So maybe Linus Torvalds will get at least a partial grant of his wish. Intel and the i9-10850K listing. Up next, this is on pre-built sites now, or at least was, briefly by accident. Earlier this year, with the release of Intel's Comet Lake S 10,000 series processors, we saw what seemed to be the full extent of what Intel's 14 nanometer aged process could be pushed to with the flagship Core i9-10900K. And that one boosted well beyond 5 gigahertz, uh, up to 5.3 with limited core boosting and TVB. So a few asterisks there on that, but still a high frequency and an old process. That kind of binning could be hard to maintain though. And this poses a challenge for Intel, which is already strapped for supply. Uh, we've seen the result of this in the form of a shortage of the 10900K across multiple marketplaces, lasting from the time of the release a couple of months ago all the way through today. Now, Intel seems to be trying to alleviate the shortage by releasing a, a new series of processors, and that might include this i9-10850K. Intel, apparently wanting to let no numbers and letters go unscathed, showing no, no quarter for uh, the alphabet or the, the numerical system, uh, is making sure it's, it's really getting its money's worth for all that ink it's putting on the boxes. So the 10850K appears to be essentially a 10900K, except 100 megahertz lower in both base and boost clocks, at least reportedly from what we've seen thus far. So that would have a, a base clock of 3.6 and a boost of 5.2, while retaining all 10 cores and 20 threads from the 10900K. These processors were likely destined to be 10900Ks, but maybe couldn't quite meet the volt frequency requirements to make the cut for such CPUs. So now they've been relabeled as 10850Ks and sold for cheaper. This is actually something of a reversal from what we saw in the AMD 3000 XT launch, where AMD increased the prices almost universally by about $100 and then changed the frequencies in the positive direction a little bit. For this one, it looks like the pricing should decrease by about $100, with the frequency decreasing by about 100 megahertz. So since we saw minimal gains from 100 megahertz swaying in either direction, the drop in price will likely prove more valuable than the frequency change itself. This processor first appeared in benchmarks early this month, but now has been more solidly confirmed as it's been spotted in a digital storm system configuration by Twitter user Momomo underscore US. 
our favorite leaker and probably the most wanted by all these companies. According to the Digital Storm listing, the 10850K will be $73 more expensive than the 10700K, placing the 10850K in the $450 price range which is $50 to $100 less than the 10900K sells for when it's available. Now, Intel does do special CPUs for just OEMs and SI, well, OEMs at least. So we're not sure if this will be exclusive to those partners or if it'll be DIY purchasable, but the existence of the processor is likely in either case to alleviate some of the difficulties of getting at least the, the 10900K because it'll be a, a strain reduction in the binning process. And if it fills a role in OEM and SI, then that's fewer 10900K is going there. So potentially 10900K will last on shelves longer with the 850K alongside it, but we'll see. Skylake X reaches EOL on this one. With another week gone by, we've got another wave of PCNs or product change notifications to parse. This week, it seems Intel Skylake X is set to be retired. For those keeping track of the various Sky and Lake CPUs, this is technically 9th gen silicon and is actually Skylake X Refresh. Skylake X Refresh was already supplanted by Cascade Lake X some time ago, and Intel has even historically lowered prices on its HEDT lines in sight of AMD's aggressive Threadripper offerings. The SKUs set to make their exit are as follows. The 9900X, 9820X, 9920X, 9940X, 9960X, and 9980XE, and the 9990XE. All Skylake X refresh SKUs were based on the Basin Falls refresh platform, used the LGA2066 socket, and required X299 chipset-based motherboards. Along with the Skylake X refresh, Intel is also sunsetting its Skylake uh, W Xeons, or most of them anyway, which makes sense because those have also been succeeded by Cascade Lake W Xeons. So if you decide you can't live without a Skylake X refresh chip at this point, you've got until January 22nd, 2021 if you're a major retailer. After that, Intel will ship final orders on July 9th of 2021. Next up, AMD's new Raise the Game Bundle. AMD often does these included game bundles. For the most part, these bundles aren't always something really worth paying attention to, but hey, if you're already looking at it, cool. It's not really something you should swing your entire decision based on since you're gonna be stuck with the vi uh, video card for a long time and the game maybe not. But the first of these bundles includes the game Godfall with the purchase of an RX 5500 series graphics card. That would include the 5500, the XT variant, and eligible 5500 laptops. AMD is also offering a bundle of Godfall and World of Warcraft Shadowlands with the purchase of a 5600 or 5700 GPU on mobile and desktop platforms. Currently, it looks like this is running from July 14th through October 3rd, and the bundled titles will be redeemable uh, from the time of release of the games through November 7th, 2020. So it does expire, and sometimes it can be a, a pain to redeem them, but maybe it's gotten better. Next up, Apple looking to TSMC to build Apple Silicon, something we've been covering in the last two weeks of news. Unsurprisingly, early reports out of Digitimes are suggesting that TSMC is on tap to manufacture Apple's upcoming replacements of Intel and uh, potentially AMD, but Intel for the CPU side. And this would be for ARM-based silicon that's destined to replace x86 in the Apple Mac products. Apple's already a top TSMC customer thanks to its A-series SOCs, and being that Apple will want its Apple Silicon on the most advanced node possible, TSMC is probably the best choice. The report, which is paywalled, also suggests that TSMC is expecting to ramp production for Apple Silicon in the first half of 2021, as Apple has reserved capacity. According to 9to5Mac, TSMC is expecting Apple's orders to account for a large portion of its wafer sales in the first half of 2021. Digitimes via 9to5Mac says, uh, quote, TSMC to see orders increase for ARM-based Macs in second half 21. TSMC is expected to see orders for Apple's Macs based on its ARM-based silicon ramp up and contribute substantially to the foundry's wafer sales starting in the second half of 21, according to industry sources. Apple is expected to introduce its first ARM-based machine actually this year, widely believed to be a smaller MacBook or a MacBook Air. However, we may very well see a proper Mac Pro by the end of 2021 with the ARM-based silicon in it. And last up, some quick product announcements that we saw this week in the PC hardware space. So Corsair launched the Corsair IQ Nexus touchscreen. <coughs> mm wonder where they, <coughs> where they got inspiration for that name. 
Surely no one's ever seen that word before. Uh, so Corsair purports, obviously that was a joke. We know that's a, a generic word. But Corsair purports this to be a companion touch screen for inclusion uh, on your desk. It's supposed to serve a variety of functions. It's also expensive, as you might expect, for anything IQ enabled. But this seems to be similar to its Elgato Stream Deck in some ways, but with less of a focus on macro functionality and more of a focus on system monitoring and IQ management. The Nexus has a 5-inch diagonal screen with a resolution of 640 by 48 pixels. It's up to 256 different screens that can be saved and swapped on there with up to six buttons on each screen that can be programmed to change IQ settings like lighting, fan control, mouse DPI, and so on. The buttons can also be set to custom macro controls or to launch applications. And additionally, screens can be used to display system performance and temperature through IQ. According to Corsair, this IQ functionality can be used even without launching the IQ client, which is good because it sucks. Uh, this might be enticing for some users if you want this stuff on your desk instead of the software open on the screen, which should be most people. Uh, the Corsair Nexus is available on Corsair's website for $100. Despite the knocks at IQ the software, the hardware solution looks interesting and kind of reminds us of those old five and a quarter bay uh, devices. Next up, Razer and the Huntsman Mini. So Razer has released a new keyboard in the Huntsman line in the form of the Razer Huntsman Mini. The Huntsman Mini is a 60% mechanical keyboard, which in case you're not familiar with the terminology is the smallest common keyboard form factor. The Huntsman Mini has RGB backlighting that can be controlled with either Razer Synapse, if you like a different taste of bloatware, or with a series of preloaded lighting effects that can be cycled through without Synapse running. Since the 60% form factor requires compromises in terms of uh, the number of keys on the keyboard, many of the keys on the Huntsman Mini have secondary functions that are printed on the sides of the keycap facing the user and can be used with a function key. The Huntsman Mini is in both black and mercury white, as they call it, with Razer's red and purple optical mechanical key switches. It's on sale on Razer's website, starting at 120 bucks with uh, the purple switches or 130 bucks with the red switches. That's it for the news recap this week. As always, our show notes and sources document is linked in the description below. We also put the uh, source websites on the screen in the B-roll if you want to check out any of the stories in more detail. And you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to support us directly by buying things like our new PC component shirt or backordering the wireframe desk mats or the PC building service mod mats. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.